So you might remember that when we were looking at uh, graphs of f prime and g prime, maybe g prime and h prime last week, we talked about how if you actually looked at the slope of those graphs, that would be the derivative of the derivative. So we said that would be called g double prime or h double prime, and we promised that we would get to that this week. Here we are. So suppose that you already have a derivative of f. You've already got f prime. How should we write its derivative? So in the Lagrange notation, we write it as f prime prime, except we don't say f prime prime, we say f double prime. And then we want to talk about how we would write this in the Leibniz notation. So remember in Leibniz notation, the derivative itself is written dy over dx. This is the first derivative, so this is the same as saying f prime. But I want to take another derivative of that, meaning I want to apply the derivative operator like we talked about last week. Remember, d over dx says take the derivative. I guess it wasn't even last week. Take the derivative of dy over dx. And this is one place where Leibniz notation is sort of cute. You can just pretend as though you're multiplying. So on the top, you're taking d times dy. So how should we write that? d squared y. On the bottom, you're taking dx times dx. How would you like to write that? Well, you may not like this, but the way that we do write it is that. Now I can already hear you're objecting. You think we should either be writing d squared x or dx in parentheses all squared. But mathematicians hate to put any parentheses in when they're not necessary. And so if you notice that whether we have the operator in Leibniz notation or the actual derivative, on the top you sometimes have a d by itself and sometimes a d attached to something else. On the bottom you never have a d by itself, meaning that when I see this dx, it's always, when I see a d, it's always attached to an x. So therefore, when we see this dx on the bottom, we're supposed to understand it as being the entire thing squared. dx as one indivisible identity, not just the x being squared there. So similarly, I think, this is not this similarly, but if I were to write this, I hope almost all of you, if not all of you, would read this as what? Time squared, right? It would take a pretty unnatural reading of this to see it as Tim times e squared, yes? How many of you watching from home read this as Tim times e squared? I'm betting nobody. Because you all recognize that T-I-M-E is one indivisible expression that's all being squared. Similarly here, this dx is one indivisible thing all being squared. So, <clears throat> of course, we're not really squaring anything. This is just our notation for the second derivative. Remember, this is not really a fraction, right? This is the actual derivative. And then we can keep going. We can take as many derivatives as we want. So the third derivative in Lagrange notation is written f triple prime. And then we would just apply another d over dx to this. So we would get on the top d to the 3y and on the bottom dx cubed. And then by the time we get to the fourth derivative, people tend to stop writing the primes up there. So instead of writing f quadruple prime, they write a 4 in parentheses. Because when you write a 4 up there without the parentheses, that already has a meaning in math. That means compose the function f with itself four times, like saying f of f of f of f of x. But there's no change needed for the Leibniz notation. And then we just keep on going similarly with that. So if you wanted to write the 1,000th derivative, you would say f and then in parentheses 1,000. Or the Leibniz notation, you would replace both of those 4s by 1,000s. So now that we have this idea of the second derivative, and we'll talk extensively about what the second derivative means in context in a minute. But let's try to extend our useful chart here. So we've already got the first two lines of the chart. We're going to try to figure out what the third line should say. And remember, f double prime is simply the derivative of f prime. So here you've got a function. You don't know anything about it. This is asking, what are you going to know about its slope? You're not going to know anything about its slope. You've got a function. You don't know anything about it. What are you going to know about its slope? 
Certainly nothing. Here you've got a function which is positive. That means that function's graph is above the x-axis. What does that tell us about the slope of that function? You should say it tells us nothing, right? Because all I know is that the graph is above the x-axis. The slope could be positive, negative, horizontal, zero. We don't know anything. Similarly, if a function is below the x-axis, we know nothing about its slope. Now we've got a function which is increasing. What do we know about its slope? If a function is increasing, its slope should be positive. And if a function is decreasing, its slope should be negative. So one thing that you have probably noticed is that in this chart, every time we move down one row, we s everything slides over two columns. Meaning that, should I even bother to draw a, a, third, a next row on this? No. What would the next row be for f triple prime? It would just be all x's, right? So just knowing these features about f tells us nothing at all about f triple prime. So there's no point in even trying to draw a third line here. So let's try to see what, where this might come up. You might, start, you might be thinking that these second derivatives are a little unusual, esoteric. They're not. We see them all the time. For example, here's a headline that you might see. Population growth is slowing. So let's suppose that p of t is the population at time t. What does this headline tell us about the sign, the S-I-G-N sign, of p, p prime, and p double prime right now? If we know that right now population growth is slowing. So what do we know about p itself? p has to be positive, right? Because p is a population. There's no way we can have a negative number of people in a population. So even if we didn't know anything about whether the population was growing or anything like that, p definitely is positive. What do we know about p prime? <clears throat> Which word here tells us about p prime? It's the word growth, right? Since the, we have population growth, that means the population is increasing. So that tells us that p prime must be positive. Now what about p double prime? I think when, I hope when you are thinking about what the graph of p might look like, the graph of population, its growth is slowing. So what are you picturing when you're thinking about that? Concave up or concave down? If the growth is slowing, the population should be looking like this, meaning concave down. And then we can think about this two different ways. We can think about that our definition of concave down, p being concave down, is that p prime is decreasing. And if p prime is decreasing, if any function is decreasing, what should be true about its derivative? Its derivative should be negative. Or we can go back to our chart here, right? We've got a concave down graph. If the original function p is concave down, the second derivative must be negative. So this simple sentence, population growth is slowing, tells us information about p, p prime, and even p double prime, just in that simple sentence. And I think that if you start to pay attention, you will find that you see sentences like this all the time, when something about a growth rate is accelerating or a growth rate is declining, when you're talking about the spread of disease or sales of phones or anything like that. We see headlines like this all the time, and they, inc they include information about all three of these functions, the function and its two derivatives. And sometimes they include information about even more, although it's a little tricky to figure it out. So in 1972, when the United States President Richard Nixon was running for re-election, at the time the country was going through some terrible inflation. Inflation means that prices are rising very rapidly. He said the rate of increase of inflation is decreasing. The rate of increase of inflation is decreasing. Let's figure out what that meant. So suppose that I'm using little p here to distinguish from capital P for population. So little p represents the level of prices. Like in the United States, maybe it's the consumer price index, however it's measured. So inflation is the rate of change of the prices. So what is this saying about inflation, p prime? That's definitely positive. Prices are going up. We have inflation. We don't have deflation. That's the normal state, right? Normally prices tend to go up a little bit. You just don't want them to go up too fast. 
Then he's saying that rate of increase of inflation. So that means inflation is increasing. So the rate of increase of inflation, if, in, if inflation is P prime, the rate of increase or the rate of change of inflation is what we would call P double prime. And that's positive. You might want to pause this and really start to think about it. I had to take a little bit of time to think about it myself here. And then finally, the full sentence. The rate of increase of inflation, which we've decided is represented in P double prime, the rate of increase of inflation is decreasing. So P double prime, this full sentence here means P double prime is decreasing. And what does it mean for something to be decreasing? It means its derivative is negative. So what he was really saying there, trying to get a little bit of good news supposedly into the campaign, he was saying that P triple prime of T is negative. So even though P prime was positive, inflation, we had inflation, prices were rising. P double prime was positive. Prices were rising faster than they had been rising last month. Yet, he tried to get a little bit of ray of sunshine into this sentence and say that P triple prime was negative. But if you were not, if you did not understand this, you might think that this sentence is much more positive economic outlook than it really is. But it's only when you really take it apart using calculus that you understand what the president was saying. All right, take a minute to think about that. Here is our graph of G prime, the same graph that we saw back in week three. And we asked a bunch of questions about this graph back then, but at that point we didn't have our higher order derivatives. So now we can ask more questions about this graph. So we've got our same graph and we're now asking at what x value, if any, is G double prime greatest, G double prime least, G double prime zero. So G double prime is the slope of this graph. So <clears throat> G double prime greatest means that now we actually do want to look at the slope of the G prime graph. So imagine drawing a little tangent line at every point and looking for the one with the greatest positive slope. And I hope you would all choose E as the answer. G double prime least means you want, if you have any negatives, you want to have the most negative. So we've got a negative slope here, less negative here, big negative here, and not as negative there. So the most negative slope we had on G prime was at H. So that's where G double prime is least. And finally, G double prime zero means where is the slope of this graph G prime? Zero. So I think we see that at C and at F. So you can go back and look at your notes from when we did the same function week three and we asked some different questions. Now we've added to these. We can also ask some interval questions now. On what intervals is G concave up? So according to our handy chart, G is concave up when G prime is what? When G prime is increasing. So where is this graph here increasing from C to F? And according to our chart, G is concave down when G prime is decreasing. So from A to C. And again, remember we don't really care about the whether to include endpoints or not. From A to C, and G prime is also decreasing from F to I. G prime concave up means where is this graph on the board concave up? So let's see, we start off concave up, and we stay concave up until we get to our inflection point at E. So G prime was concave up from A to E, and then we're concave up again a little bit from H to I. So A to E and H to I. G prime is concave down when this graph on the board is concave down, which is just this little stretch right in here from E to H. G double prime is positive when G prime is what? G double prime is positive when G prime is increasing. So where is this graph here increasing from C to F? So have we already answered that question? 
Is this question here, part E, the same as another question? G double prime positive, if you look back at your handy chart, G double prime is positive is the same as saying G concave up. So the answer to question A is the same as the answer to question E. Similarly, G double prime negative is the same as saying G concave down, so these should be the same answers, and let's confirm that. G double prime negative is when, this, when G prime has a negative slope. So where is the slope of this graph negative? From A to C, and then again from F to I, and look, those are exactly the same answers that we wrote down for part B where G was concave up. <clears throat> so what I've tried to do here is to try to avoid the standard cliched example, which is what we'll do next, of using second order derivatives, which is for equation of motion. P the thing that people go to first usually is acceleration. And we'll get to acceleration when we do a come back after the break. But all of these examples here had nothing to do with equations of motion, right? They had to do with prices and inflation, and then the other one was about population growth. So I hope we've convinced you that we see rates of change and second derivatives just all over the place, and it's just a matter of recognizing and understanding what the sentence is really telling you. And I think we have a check your understanding now for you to practice with this. <laughs>